Anybody object if we start a little bit early since the room is full? I'll cover the boring parts first where I talk about myself for a couple of minutes. <coughs> This is content strategy in popular culture. This is not going to be an advanced session, but I am going to share with you some of the metaphors that I have used with actual clients to help them understand content strategy a little bit better. I am Brett Meyer. I am the Chief Strategy Officer with Think Shout. It's a fantastic title. Gets to mean whatever I need it to mean. <laughs> now it means that I lead our strategy engagements, our UX team, and some of our business development. Uh, actually, 15 years ago, I was vice president of another web development company. We specialized in financial sites. We did sites for mortgage brokers. We did sites for giant derivatives traders. Um, at the same time, my wife was working for a financial management firm, so we were all about money all the time. And we got tired of it at the same time. We quit our jobs, we sold almost all of our things, and we joined the Peace Corps. That is a story for another time, but suffice to say, it was very, very hot. Um, I came back. I was lucky enough to get a job doing communications with the Nonprofit Technology Network. I eventually became the communications director there, and the, during that time, I had the opportunity to work with thousands and thousands of nonprofits, including things around content strategy. Uh, and then I moved on to ThinkShout. Um, in the time in between, I've been a semi-professional movie reviewer, I've been a professional music reviewer, and it is my dream when I retire someday to start a blog that reviews commercials, so hopefully we can see some improvement there. Mm -hmm. So I work at ThinkShout. ThinkShout is a digital strategy and development agency. We're based in Portland, Oregon, and almost all of our work is with nonprofits and social good organizations. I'm very happy to be part of this team and lucky enough to have had the opportunity to work with organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Humane Society of the United States, who happen to have a lot of content. So I've been thinking about content a lot, a lot over the last few years. So content strategy. At its basic level, content strategy is just having a plan to fill up the websites that everybody here is building with things that are going to be useful to end users and also beneficial to the organization's end goals. The definition that I tend to use is very dry. This is from usability.gov, which actually does have a lot of great resources. Content strategy focuses on the planning, creation, delivery, and governance of content. This is slightly different from the standard slide that people see at content strategy sessions from Christina Halverson. She includes the words useful and usable. I feel that those are value judgments. And when you are a content strategist, yes, you want to get the content to the state that it is useful and usable. But in reality, you are going to have to deal with a lot of legacy content that is neither of those things. So for the purposes of the work, you have to assume that the end goal is useful and usable, but you're going to have a lot of work to do along the way. And in practice, that means you're going to be using a lot of spreadsheets and page templates. Content strategy at its basic level is really not exciting. But it is very necessary. So I'm going to try to make it a little bit more exciting today. Because the reason that we build websites is the content that is going to be going into it. And that should not be a chore. So we need to focus on the why of the content. And when I talk about content, I'm not just talking about text. This is the images. It's the videos. It's the animations. It's whatever you are putting on your website that is going to be useful to some human being in the world. Um, your content is the connection between your organizational goals and your audience's motivations. And any time a piece of content is added to the website, it is because somebody somewhere at some point thought it was going to be useful. It may not have turned out to be useful, but I, I hope that you, so nobody's just putting up content because it was their job and they had to get the blog post up for the day, and so that's what they did. But if you don't have a strategy, and the bottom line is that if you don't have a strategy for the governance of creation and updating of content, your quest is probably doomed to fail. So I've actually realized that my interest in content strategy goes back to my teenage years when I was a comic book collector. I was collecting comic books at exactly the wrong time. It was the late 80s and Marvel and all of those things were using chromium covers and pre-wrapping the comic books in plastic so you were destroying your investment if you actually wanted to read them. 
This is a, it was a little weird. Anyway, I still love the comic books. And I love them so much that I built a flat file database and a way to access that on my Amiga 500. And I kept track of every single comic book I had. I cross-referenced it with the supposed value from Wizard Magazine. And essentially what I had done was perform a content audit of all of my content books. And I loved it. And that's the thing. Content audits seem like a boring task. But the content on your website, if you love doing it, it's not a chore. If you love doing it, it's going to be something that you want to do. You want to make your content better on a daily basis. And the tools that you build are going to be able to help you do that. We love our own content, and every organization we work with should be similarly invested in the content that they put on their sites. So this is my favorite content audit template. It gets down to the brass tacks. There is the content users want, there is the content the organization wants, and there's the content that nobody wants. This is from John McCrory. And he makes a very simple case that the most important content is the content that the users want. Because at the end of the day, your content can be perfectly suited toward the goal that you're trying to achieve. If it does not connect or resonate with the end users, if nobody actually wants to use that content, then that content has no value. So there are some things that we need to know before we can start developing our content strategy. Uh, at ThinkShout, we go through our discovery process that includes the content portion. And we believe we need to understand three basic things when we are working with these nonprofit organizations. We need to understand their goals. We need to understand their audiences. And then we need to get into the content at that point, since the content is the connection between those two things. So goals. There has to be a reason that you're putting stuff up on the internet. You're not just doing it for fun. Uh, maybe the goal is fun. If that's, if that's your goal is just to have fun, that's fine. Um, actually, that probably explains why cat videos dominate the internet. Because <coughs> they're fun. But the clients that you're working with, or even your own organizations, you have goals. You're trying to accomplish something with this content. And you're trying to accomplish something in the world. Nobody starts a company just for the heck of it. I suppose there are probably a few people. But generally, if you start a company, you want to do something. Nike wants to sell shoes. Uh, Coca-Cola wants to make our teeth rot. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center wants to educate people about hatred in, in, the, in the United States and talk about how that can be dealt with. So at the high level, you've got these goals. And the content has to support the goals of the organization. But then you've got the project goals. And building a website, as great as it can be, is only a subset of the organization's goals. The website is a tool that is going to help the organization accomplish its goals. It's become a central tool because it's the easiest way to get content out in the world. But it's still a tool. So when you embark on a project to rebuild a website, to build a website from scratch, to improve it, to treat the content in some way, you're embarking on a project. And you need to set the goals for what that project is going to accomplish. So building the website, how is that going to help the organization? How is it going to help them achieve their goals? And then you've got your audiences. Is anybody lucky enough in here to be working on a website that only has a single audience? <laughs> yeah. In reality, building a website full of content is difficult because you're trying to serve so many people. And all of those people have different needs. They can be grouped into different buckets. Uh, generally, we talk with nonprofits. They've got departments, and all of those departments want different things. So the communications department wants names for the email list, and the, the, the fundraising department, of course, wants people to donate. But they've got all of these various folks coming to them. They might have students. They might have teachers. They might have government employees. All of these folks are going to have different reasons for coming to the website. So when you're thinking about audiences, you need to think about what are they trying to accomplish when they come visit your website? What is their motivation for seeking out your website? Um, you've probably seen a lot of statistics around how much traffic is coming from search engines these days. Uh, we have many, many clients who have in excess of 60% of their traffic coming from organic search, and then a big chunk that's also coming from social media. People don't come in through the home page and then navigate through the path that we want them to navigate through. They come in because they're looking for something. Google is helping them shortcut all of your careful plays at information architecture and getting them straight to the content that hopefully they want. 
So you can take a look at your data and you can try to start to figure out, well, what do people want from us? What is the content that is resonating? How can we do more of that? You also have to take into account your audience's tolerance for digging to find the content that they want. Say they click on a Google link and the first thing that they come up with is not what they were looking for. How are you going to show them that maybe you have something else on your website that is going to be more useful to them? And how much work are they going to be willing to do to fight your information architecture to find what they're looking for? And you have to also have to take into account their experience. And this can mean all sorts of things. It can mean how many times they've interacted with your website before. If they're a first time user, they probably have very different needs from somebody who has come back to your site 10, 15 times, understands your information architecture and can easily navigate your website to find just what, their work, what they want. Uh, you can also think about it in terms of experience with technology. Uh, I know that I have to take technical support calls from my parents at least once a month to help them do something with their computer. Uh, it's, I bet a lot of you have similar experiences in here, but that's not the case with you, and it's certainly not the case for the generation that's coming up behind us who have never known life without the internet. And in the end, what they're looking for is content that is going to be useful to them in their own lives. They're generally not coming to your website simply because they think you are cool. They're looking for something that is going to help them do something that they want to do in their own life. So your content needs to prove to be useful to them. So how do you bring this together? Content is the connection between your audience's motivations and the goals of the organization. So let's consider Marvel's extended universe here for a moment. Has anybody seen Captain America yet? Is it good? It doesn't follow the comic at all? Okay. It did, however, have an amazing launch. And does anybody remember when they first started kicking this off? Let's see if I can get this out here. Oh, no. No, oh, I don't know if the audio is going to work. Anyway... This is from the original Iron Man movie back in 2008. And this is the introduction of Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And this is where they first started teasing the Avengers. Who the hell are you? 2008. Now we're up here two, eight years later, and they've brought it for a full circle. They've made billions and billions of dollars off of this franchise. And when I first saw this trailer, I knew what they were leading up to, and I thought there was no way it was going to work mostly because I didn't like the Avengers when I was reading comic books, but. <laughs> but it did work, and Marvel has been, where'd my mouse go, incredibly successful marketing its project, product. There is, of course, another comic book company out there. There are several more. How many have seen this movie? How was that one? Yeah, uh, that's what I've been hearing about. But let's break this down a little bit. Both of these companies, whoa. Okay. Both of these companies have goals. That goal is basically to make money off of their intellectual property. Uh, of course, they want to maintain their brand. In this case, they want to make sure that they are putting out compelling content that is going to encourage you to come back when they do, what are they doing, Secret Wars? No, uh, so Infinity War next. So Marvel wants to make sure that they're building up to this big comic book art that they did maybe 10 years ago uh, in print format. Of course, DC wants to do the same thing. They both have the same goals. And they have a huge library of legacy content. I mean, this is stretching back decades and decades into the probably 40s or 50s for DC originally, and Marvel was... All right, all the way, all the way back to the 30s. So this, this is a lot of content. They have a huge content library. And at a base level, I mean, Batman versus Superman's doing okay. It made $875 million, or is on track to make $875 million worldwide. Uh, that is not nearly as much money as people expected it to make. It's got a 27% score on Rotten Tomatoes and a B on Cinema Score, which is apparently bad for an audience review. Um, we can talk about that later if you'd like. Civil War launched much, or like 10% above that. They're predicting that it's going to make one and a half billion dollars worldwide. It's got 90% on Rotten Tomatoes and an A on Cinema Score. Let me look at my stats here. So in Marvel's 10 films since 2008, they've averaged 237 million in production costs and, and they have 
an average worldwide ticket sale of 714 million. DCs made 200 or cost 265 million per film and average only 560 million. So they're spending more and they're making less. Uh, and if you take away Christopher Nolan's Batman movies, which were fantastic, that number falls a lot. So I would argue that in considering their audience, DC has largely lost track of their audience's motivations. They want to have an enjoyable time at the theater. From everything I've heard, Batman vs. Superman was not an enjoyable time at the theater. Okay, unless you like explosions. You pretend it's not okay. And they both have experience of the content, but DC has underestimated what it means, or what they were looking for in terms of audience tolerance. How dark were the audiences willing going to go? How far away from the character that some people knew from the 60s and 70s and may not have experienced Frank Miller's reboot in the late 80s when Batman did start to actually get dark. But the DC movies are very, very dark. Marvel's movies are bright and sunny and funny and people like them. They figured out what their audience wanted and they are reaping the benefits of it. So, audience is very important. Movies have a built-in advantage when it comes to content structure. It's a fixed medium. I mean, when they're writing the screenplay, they even traditionally stick with a three-act narrative. I, there is a very strict set of guidelines to writing a screenplay that you can take classes at if you think that you're going to be able to write something better than Batman versus Superman, and please try. Um, but as website builders, we're generally starting from the ground up. Drupal gives us all of these amazing combinations of ways that we can display and show various types of content, including entire movies. So I'm going to spend a little bit talking about the content model, because this technical aspect of content strategy is, is often overlooked. But we as site builders know that we need a solid technical content model defining the structures and boundaries of what we can create if we're going to be successful. And it's not a problem unique to websites. How many people have made a diagram like this before? Something along the lines of delineating all of your content types and their various fields and everything that's going to be displayed on the page. All right, let's talk about a video game. <coughs> Has anybody played Dragon Age Inquisition? Yep. Uh, two years ago, I actually convinced my wife, Melissa, that I needed to buy a PlayStation specifically so I could see what the user interfaces was like. <coughs> And it turned out it was pretty good because they're doing some cool things there. If you've played this role-playing game, you know that it can be incredibly complex. So, and Stephanie, thank you for your help figuring this out. If you want to create a mighty offense tonic that will provide damage bonus against the barrier, you need to collect and combine 11 embryum, 11 deep mushroom, and 2 rash vine nettle. And only the warrior class character can use it. And there, you know, there are 15 potion types, each with multiple variations, and there are weapons and armor and on and on. They have a content model that is running all of this. When you are creating this potion, it knows how much of each ingredient you have because it's being stored in separate data structures. When you combine it, you put it into a new data structure, and then you're able to use it in the game. And it is pretty seamless once you have collected all of those things and made the potion. You can use the potion when you are in combat the actual mechanics of the gameplay are pretty fantastic because you don't notice the underlying structure that is there. You're just playing the game and using that potion to give you more health so, or more power so that you can inflict more damage. Another one of my favorite examples is from Pearl Jam. Um, people visit their website. I mean, they have some pretty clear motivations. Uh, at this point, they're making their money selling concert tickets and selling bootleg albums uh, that they record themselves. So there's a lot that's not to like about their website. It is not responsive. It is not built on Drupal, as far as I can tell. But they have done some fantastic things with their content structure that enable them to meet their goals. So this is a song page. And pretty much every song they have ever recorded or performed live has a place on the website. And every song is structured exactly the same. You can see it's got a title, a release date, the composer, the artist, the image, and the lyrics. That's it. Everything on that page and much of the site is built through the application of structured data. So here is an album. It's a different content type, if this was built in Drupal. It's got a title, a release date, cover image, 
links to purchase the album, of course, and a little bit of text, but then it's got a song reference field. We would probably use entity reference if we were building this in Drupal. And the reference field is pretty key. So every album is a collection of references to individual songs rather than a list built by hand. And if you click on the song, of course, it takes you to the detail for that song. It gets more interesting when you take a look at their set list, which is another type of structured content. As I said, they have somehow managed to keep track of every song they have ever played anywhere in the world dating back to, I think, 1990 or something like that. So if you want to see all of the 662 times they've played Jeremy, you can find that on your website. But you'll see that the set list is similar. It's got the venue, the location, probably uh, linked to the concert poster image, product links, the bootleg, and then the song reference field again. So again, they are building these lists of songs by referencing extracurricular entities that are songs, or they're building these set lists by referencing all of these songs. So when you are looking around the website and you're looking at all of those 662 times that they've played Jeremy, it's getting you to this page and on that page is a link to buy the bootleg album. So if you find, oh, hey, they played, they recorded that concert that I saw in Portland, Oregon, I am encouraged just by exploring their site to buy the bootleg album so that I can reminisce about what a great concert that was. The entire structure of their website is built to get you to these things so that you are encouraged to buy something or do something that takes advantage or that is going to benefit Pearl Jam. So, not a great website, great content model. Uh, the truth of the matter, though, is that your infrastructure needs to be invisible. We're building these content models, we're building the content types, we're creating the fields, we're rendering them, we're sending it over to the front, engineer, front end engineers to make it look really good. But at the end of the day, if somebody comes to a website and says, oh, this is built in Drupal, then we've probably failed at something. Take a look at what George Miller did with Mad Max. Did everybody see Mad Max? All right. So this is actually a pre-post-production shot. And when he was done with it, it looked like that. Similarly, when the truck goes under that underpass that ends up collapsing, this is what that looked like in real life. But when you're watching the movie, you don't see all of the architecture that went into making this such an experience. You just see the finished product. There, you don't see the underlying infrastructure, and that's what we need our websites to do. We need people to come experience the content, think this is a great experience, and the technology should just work. I will note that having perfect infrastructure does not necessarily mean you are being entirely successful. I will pause for a moment so everybody can get the joke. <clears throat> That's pretty funny. Anyway, here is an example of what was pretty much perfect infrastructure that did not end up succeeding to its creator's expectations. The prequel movies were technological marvels. I mean, he did some amazing things with computer graphics, with CGI, which, with making this universe look like it was much bigger than it actually was. But at the end of the day, the trilogy looked a lot like a video game, and people just didn't connect with it the way that people have connected with the original movies and more recently with The Force Awakens. Everybody seen The Force Awakens? I thought this last lightsaber duel on, what was it, Starkiller base, uh, was pretty fantastic. The little cross piece that was going to poke him aside, you could hear the lightsaber buzzing. You could hear when it hit the snow, and if you saw it in a big TH theater, there were TH, THC theater, THX theater. <laughs> <coughs> ah. <coughs> THX theater. You could actually feel the weight of the fight. It was a very physical thing. Much of The Force Awakens got back to what the original trilogy was. It felt like a real thing that you were watching. There was, there was this physicality to it. The infrastructure was great. The content was great. The presentation was, of it was great. And so it made like $2 billion. Oh yeah. This is an aside. 
You are going to help yourselves immensely if you build your websites with real content. Nobody should be using lorem ipsum at this point. Nobody should be using any of the other ipsum generators, which include hipster ipsum, bacon ipsum. We can go on and on with that. That should, if you need to use that for some early prototypes, fine. But when you're building the website, you need to be using real content. Uh, the real content is often going to be different from whatever guess you're taking at at the number of paragraphs and images somebody might want to put into a piece of content. There are lots of ways that you can do this. At ThinkShout, we have actually modified a Google Doc spreadsheet that we can import directly into all of the content types every time a site is built. So it pulls the content from the spreadsheet and just throws it up on the site while we're building it so the clients can see what their real content type real content looks like in place. Uh, there's sites like Gather Content where you can effectively build out your content types and then migrate it over afterwards. Uh, I think our technical team is discussing whether or not it makes sense to build out a base level Drupal 8 instance with just the structure of the content where the client can fill it in and then we can migrate it over to the build in progress. Okay. It's just seeing if that was news to live. Uh, so there are lots of ways to do that, but you're going to have much more success building websites if you get the actual content into the build process instead of waiting for some content staging phase right before you're going to launch. If you do that, you're probably going to need to bump your launch date out a couple of months because things are not going to be the way the client expected them to be. All right, let's talk a little bit about information architecture. This is where Content strategy and, and IA essentially bleed into each other. If users can't find the content that they want on your website, if the paths that benefit your organi organization are not well-defined and can't be tracked and measured, then the best written copy in the history of copy is not going to help you. Has anybody ever had trouble finding information on a website somewhere on the internet? Okay. I like to think about it in terms of going to a cereal aisle at a new store. Say I wasn't awake in time to go to the breakfast at DrupalCon this morning and I wanted to go out to a grocery store to find some milk and cereal. You've all been in the cereal aisle, I'm sure. And when you go to a new one, they've organized it differently and I have to navigate the seven kinds and three different sizes of Cheerios to find the golden grams because I want golden grams and I don't care about the rest of this. But when you go into a store for the first time, you have no idea how they've organized this information. You just know that the cereal is hopefully grouped together. And if you spend a long enough time scanning the shelves, you're going to find what you want. It's very difficult. Let's go back to Dragon Age for a moment. So the first thing that you notice about this game is how incredibly huge it is. If you want to climb a mountain, you can run over and climb a mountain. It doesn't have to do anything with the text. Um, I guess it, it can get too steep and jumping will only get you so far. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce that word, Stephanie. So there is going to be a small number of people who want to explore every nook and cranny of this game and a lot of the other games that are coming out. Um, but they can't just rely on great content. If you, no, well, we'll see how successful some of the, the games coming out later this summer are going to be. But if you're designing a game in the hopes that people are just going to run around and look at the pretty gra graphics that you've created, it's probably not going to compel them for very long. So in Dragon Age, there is a lot of actual content. There are quests, there are written documents. It's all tied together uh, to help you be more interested in the graphical world that they've created. So the, the world itself is the equivalent of the website, and they've put all of this stuff in in terms of content. And they've organized it so you can explore as much of it as you want. But if you just want to go from quest to quest, it is very, very easy to do. Now, trying that on a website generally leads to those websites being very overloaded. Um, there, there's been a design trend that was in vogue for a long time. You can still see it on like news sites, the New York Times and CNN, where it's just a huge collection of links. All they're trying to do is to get you to go to various types of other stories without focusing on what you might be wanting to do. So when you've got all of these blocks of encouragement essentially to go to some place other than you were hoping to go, it largely gets in your way. So I'm going to quickly show this website, although this is not popular culture. This is the somewhat recent Amnesty International site, and they have taken 
their content organization to an extreme. So they have a very limited IA. There's not many options in the navigation. There are not many sub pages under that navigation. So what they've done to get content out of the way of other content is build this resource library. You can see there that they have 40,028 results and pretty much the only way that you're going to get to that content through their website, except for a couple of places where they have related content blocks, is to use the faceted search to find what you want. Again, this is an extreme example. I'm not advocating that you put all of your content into a faceted search library. I will note that it does help very advanced users find stuff very quickly. Uh, as I said, you are going to have to deal with legacy content at some point, and there are ways that you can architect your solution that is going to be helpful. So one of our clients is facing history in ourselves. They are, they essentially teach moral education uh, or ethical education in schools and they provide a lot of great content to people around it. We started working with them about three and a half years ago. This is a shot of their website when they, when we first started working with them. This was on Drupal 6. Uh, we did not build it. And we actually inherited a set of designs from another firm and we were told to, to build out the new site. You can see, and I've intentionally chosen a very simple piece of content to demonstrate this concept. Uh, you can see that this is a really simple thing. It doesn't have a lot of information. People going into this are probably going to read that and they're probably going to leave. The same was true when we rebuilt that site. Uh, in part because we were not given a design for what the teaching strategy content type should be. And so we just put the content up on the page. But if somebody finds this on Google, they're going to go to the page and they're going to read the content and they're going to leave. So we recently had an opportunity to redo this piece of legacy content. Again, this is pretty much exactly the same. They have not changed the words in this content for three years. So what we helped them do was make sure they had a robust taxonomy in place that allowed them to put related content blocks and calls to action in, associated, in association with that content. So without actually touching that content, we made it more useful. Uh, that related content block that you see there can be either automatically generated based on taxonomy, or they can create something that looks exactly the same and exactly reference the content that they want on that page and then place that block uh, if they want to spend the time. They can also change out those calls to action down at the bottom if they have specific calls to action that they think are going to be more useful for that particular piece of content. So the wrappers that you are putting around content on your websites can actually take a, or make a lot of strategic sense when you know that your clients are not going to go back to that and touch that piece of content that they built 10 years ago that they're just not going to give up on. But as I've been saying and I'm going to continue to say, your actual content has to remain central to the user's experience of it. And at ThinkShout, we've generally recommended streamlining all the information that's around it. Uh, how, many site, how many times do you go to sites where there are pop-ups that are encouraging you to do something else? What they're doing is getting in the way of what you were actually trying to do in the first place, and that's why it's so annoying. Now, there are times when that makes sense. We work with nonprofits. In December, the last two weeks of December, you can make an, a reasonable assumption that somebody is coming to the website to donate because, as Americans, we procrastinate and we don't do our tax write offs until the last two days of the year. I know this to be true because I have seen the actual data at this point. Like a good 35, 40% of some nonprofit donations come in on December 31st. Um, so when that's happening, it's reasonable to say, okay, I'm gonna put a pop-up up. You're coming to donate, just click this button, get them to it. Uh, in that case, you are working with their motivations instead of making them fight against what it is that you want to do to get to what they want to do. Uh, and if you wanna think about it in terms of Dragon Age, some of them may want to explore your entire world. Most of them do not. Don't make it hard for either one of them. So as you plan your content structures, you need to keep in mind the navigational elements, the related content blocks, the search filters, and the calls to action that are gonna transform the user's delight that you gave them this great piece of content to nudge them in a direction that is going to be useful to your organization or to the clients that you're working with. So is your goal to convince visitors to sign up for an email list? That's a pretty easy one. Highlight that call to action. Minimize everything else that you're asking them to do. Don't try to get them to go read other blog posts at that point. Don't try to get them to donate. Just focus on getting them to sign up for the email list. 
Once you've captured the email list, you do what Netflix, you do what Facebook does, and you send them occasional reminders saying, hey, don't forget about us. We've still got all this great content. Come back and visit our website. So that's kind of a roundabout saying, way of saying that I find advertising very annoying. Advertising's entire existence is to convince us that we are not doing what we should be doing at that very moment. If you're reading a magazine, you've got an advertisement that's trying to catch your attention to buy a watch. You're trying to watch your favorite television show and you have to watch the muscle-bound Geico guys pumping iron in the gym. I actually kind of like this one. It's cute. Uh, but commercials get in the way of what you're trying to do. You're trying to watch Daredevil. You're trying to watch whatever show it is that you're trying to watch. And the advertisements are interrupting that and trying to get you to think about or do something else. Some advertisements are trying to get you to crash your car. Billboards are there to make you look up from what you're supposed to be doing, driving safely down the road, to convince you that maybe you need a new pair of shoes at that very moment. And, of course, websites are not immune. ESPN is trying to distract me from the reality that Stephen Curry is going to tear the heart out of my beloved Trailblazers tonight to buy me to buy or to get me to buy some Crown Royal to drown my sorrows. <laughs> Advertising is trying to get people to do something other than what they want to do. So why would we build websites that encourage that? We have the control, we have the power to just offer a few options that are highly tailored to the content that they're interested in to encourage them to do what we want without saying, hey, maybe you want to do this and this and this and this, so that they're overwhelmed with options and ultimately decide to do none of them. That's the reason that Netflix has been incredibly successful. Even with back to the DVD thing, you could get the DVDs in the mail, you could watch the DVD, and you had no commercials. They're original programming. They have no commercials when you're paying $10 a month. You can download the most recent episodes of your favorite Netflix show. You can watch them all on a weekend that you want. There are no distractions along the way. In fact, they've built their app so that the next episode will start playing pretty much immediately because they're assuming that's what you want. They're not trying to get you some to do something else. They're trying to say... This is our great content. We want you to experience it. We're going to put such great content out there that you are going to continue to pay $10 a month, and we're going to be fine with that. We're not going to try to do anything else. HBO is doing something similar, although the HBO Go interface annoys me for, for some reason. I'm, but you can watch their shows without commercial interruption, and that's an, why HBO is being incredibly successful at this point, too. So I've spent a long time talking about the technical side of things. We should probably talk a little bit about the content itself. And when I say written word, I'm also including, of course, images and videos and all of the other content that you are filling your websites up with. First of all, it takes time to make great content. You can make some content very quickly. You can throw it up on the web. Uh, it's probably not going to be super useful. If you want to get something that's going to resonate with your audience, that's going to be useful to your audience, then you have to spend time planning it and getting it up there. Let's uh, talk about Mad Max again. George Miller first tried to make Mad Max uh, Fury Road back in 2001. He took it up again in 2011, and he, wrapped, he didn't wrap photography until 2013, that means the movie didn't come out until two years later. Uh, typically, Hollywood calls that development hell. And has anybody in here seen Ishtar? Oh, a couple. Yeah, but there's a reason that not a lot of people have seen that, but a lot of people have seen Mad Max. George Miller took a lot of time making Mad Max be exactly what he wanted to be. And because he did that, it resonated with his audience. I need to stop using the word resonate. Sorry, anybody got a, something else that... No, okay. Connected? Okay, thank you. And you can see that in a bunch of the other movies that have come out. The Lego movie was in production for four years. I thought it was going to be terrible. It was adorable. I loved the Lego movie. How about Boyhood? Have you seen Boyhood? Everybody knows how long that took. He spent 12 years making that movie. And it was a movie about people living their lives. And it was fantastic. It was amazing. So it's clear that with the right people involved, movies benefit from allowing the directors to realize their vision. 
You can expand that into books and movies, or um, books and music. It's very difficult outside of some punk albums that I can think of to just go into the studio, to go sit in a corner, write a great novel, and come up with something that is really going to be timeless. The same is true for content that we're putting on your websites. I'm not saying that you should be like James Joyce and obsess over every single word. I am encouraging you to spend time making sure that you are thinking about the goals of your organization, the goals of your website, and what your audiences want as you are creating that content. Let me assure you that people do read on the internet. There is this meme um, started a long time ago by people who did eye test studies that people don't read. I will wager that the content that they gave these folks for the eye test studies was not interesting. How many people have not read an article through to completion on the internet? Oh, one person in the back, really? Okay, well, I, I know that there are some great sites the New Yorker, the New York Times has some fast, fantastic long-form content. ESPN has long-form content. And I will read every word of that because I'm interested in it. People read content that they are interested in. People skip and scan and leave content when they are not interested in it. So you, your goal as content strategists, as content authors, as website developers, is to come up with the content that people want to read. And you don't have to get everybody to read it. Everybody is not your target audience. If you've gone through the work of defining who your audiences are, it's much easier to define what the content is that you should be putting up on the website. And you're going to know what is going to be interesting to them. Uh, briefly, it's OK to repeat yourself. And this is a big task, especially with Google pretty much rewarding sites that freshen their content up and add new content all the time. Uh, this is easier than on, in email than it is on websites. Like for something like DrupalCon, I know when I was doing marketing for a conference site, we would reuse words from the year before and customize it to meet the needs of this year's conference. Uh, if that's content that's probably going to be a, a, applicable to your website too. The Drupal Association does DrupalCon every year. Certain aspects of DrupalCon are going to be the same every year, so you can reuse some of that content. Uh, hopefully you're A-B testing it so you can make it a little bit better every year, and you can just change the dressing around it because you already know that it's compelling. Anybody think of an example of a movie that reused a lot of content from an earlier time and was very successful for it? <laughs> I hope I'm not spoiling anything. It's still fun. You should go see it. Uh, ultimately, though, you need to stay true to your vision. You need to stay true to your audience. When you think about it empirically, Fury Road should not have succeeded with mainstream audiences. It's a two-hour chase scene. That's all it is. The hero's face is obscured for half the movie, except that Furios is the real hero of the movie, as we all know. Uh, it's daylight or it's nighttime scenes were filmed in daylight and it prominently features a tr tanker truck full of breast milk but it grossed almost 500 million dollars worldwide and Fury Road succeeded because it stayed true to George Miller's vision he created something that was unique that was great and he was not the only one who wanted to see as it turned out because he stayed true to what he wanted to put on the screen it connected with people thank you for that and he cut down just to the bare elements of what he needed for that movie. So they storyboarded the entire thing before they started filming. They largely worked without a script. And he put just a few words into the script. Uh, Google tells me that Fury Road had roughly 3,600 spoken words across its two-hour running time you can consider a, even a mediocre movie like Jupiter Ascending, also an action movie, has nearly 9,000 words because it is burdened by the presumed need to explain what's going on. Here's a quote. Your planet is just now entering its genetic age. You understand very little about something which is a vital part of our reality. In our world, Genes have an almost spiritual significance. They are the seeds of your, our immortality. When the exact same genes reappear in the same order, it is for us what you would call reincarnation. I'm not entirely convinced that we needed to hear that. Fury Road doesn't care about telling us what's going on. 
Because it doesn't matter. Why doesn't Furiosa have an arm? That's backstory. You just accept it. How did Morton Joe come to control all the water? Well, he just does. He's a very bad man. You know he's the bad guy. <laughs> and it doesn't matter because it's a two-hour chase scene. All he did was cut away all of the backstory that was unnecessary to the story he wanted to tell and put in just what he wanted to. He cut the movie to its barest bones, and that fitted, it fit his vision perfectly. Our clients as nonprofits have a built-in advantage because they have their mission, their values, and their vision as their touchstones. They know the backstory of the organization and why they do the work, so that can inform the content that they're producing. You don't need to retell your entire story every time you're putting up your content on your website. It needs to be focused, it needs to accomplish a goal, and it needs to be what your audience is going to find useful. Because in the end, content has to matter. If, I don't know if you have to work with nonprofits to have heard about the ladder of engagement. Is everybody familiar with this concept? That you're going to get people to slowly climb the rungs uh, through a small action all the way up to being what the nonprofit ultimately wants. So maybe the first thing you do is come to the website and read a piece of content. That's the first rung. They said, okay, that was great. I'm going to go back. I remember this website. And the second time they go, they find three more pieces of content, and they say, you know, this was really good. I'm going to give you my email address, and you can continue to get in touch with me. They're climbing the ladder to the point where they're going to donate and in every nonprofit's dream someday leave a legacy bequest when they pass away and give the nonprofit everything that they owned. This is not how it works in real life. I prefer to think of it as a game of shoots and ladders. Now, this is really neither here nor there, but three members of my immediate family were diagnosed with some form of cancer in the past year. And if you have had this experience, or really almost any real experience in life, you know that life gets in the way of any perfect system that we're trying to design. People do not move linearly from giving you an email address to eventually giving you everything they ever, ever owned. They're going to have setbacks. There are going to be times when they don't visit your website for things that are going on in their own lives. We have to take that into account. We are providing content, we're providing information that is supposed to be valuable to the end user. At Dries's keynote yesterday, he was talking about developers as an audience, and he was talking about site builders, essentially, and content editors as an audience, and then you had the people who were using the website. Well, you think about that in real numbers. How many folks are actually building Drupal? Thousands, several thousand, maybe a couple of tens of thousands. How many people are using Drupal websites to add content or to build these websites? Probably in the hundred thousands into the low millions. How many people are using Drupal websites? Tens of millions of people are using websites. We are building websites to fulfill the promise of the internet. The promise of the internet that is that people can find information that they need that is going to be useful to them in some way in their lives without any encumbrance. Everybody is going to be able to find the same information. And I could do a whole net about or a rant about network neutrality that I'm going to skip for now. The point of building a website is to put content on it that people are going to find useful. But we can't assume that, they, that users are going to do what we want. We have to do our best as content creators to figure out what it is that they want and make sure that that content is going to be waiting for them when they are ready to engage with it. So. That is the slides that I have prepared, and I'm hoping that you have questions because that's really my favorite part of this. There is a microphone in the front if you want to ask a question. Uh, this is being recorded, so if you want to just yell it out for the back, I can repeat it for the recording and posterity. I see a question in the back. Uh, 
I can cheat because I was an email marketer and I learned how to segment people by activity. So you, you know list churn happens. I mean, people are just going to drop off, but there are folks who are not reading their emails regularly because of something that's going on in their, in their own life. So I always just segmented those, fo those folks off into a separate list of inactives. And when we had a singularly great piece of content that we were trying to push people through, that's when I would try to reactivate them. So you don't want to just keep pushing it in their face all the time. You want to accept that, okay, maybe they are not interested in this right now. Let's wait until we have something that they, we really think they're going to be interested in and try to recapture their attention at that point. Yep. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's where we start. We do start with the data. We do try to figure out what it is. I mean, on ThinkShout's own blog, we have a blog post from, I think, 2010 that Sean Larkin wrote about some technology that I don't even remember at this point. It is not useful to us as an organization right now, but it's clearly sitting up there at the top of our analytics. Uh, but yeah, you start with the data. You try to find what it is. You do the audience work. Uh, we do a lot of work around creating personas and then we try to map the content that exists to the personas and what their motivations are. Try to figure out, well, okay, are they not reading this content because it's not meeting their motivations? How do we improve it? So the data is a big part of it. Um, we also do work interviewing representative users. Uh, we do surveys where we take what we learn from the interviews, we figure out what questions are to fill in the gaps in our, in our knowledge, we send the surveys out. Uh, it, it's a pretty long process. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to put some metrics around what success means to you in terms of that content, and it's going to be different for every content type. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yes, well, hopefully it has relevance for users then because it's still popping up at that point. Uh, I try to, you definitely don't want to put that sort of content in any kind of navigation system. Uh, it's okay for it to live somewhere. It just needs to be out of the way. And when you do have good SEO, when people are coming to find that content that has passed its shelf life, uh, I found it helpful to put a unique call to action on that page. Like on Sean's blog post, you just put a little block somewhere that says, we know that this information is out of date, you might be more interested in this article. So yes, that's, that's what I do with Drupal. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, Great. The question is about a government agency when they have lots of types of content and it's spread out over multiple pages and you want to make sure that people are going to read it. Are these, is this information PDF sometimes? No. no? Okay. Well, that's good. That's a good start. Uh, government information is difficult because it's dry. Often. <laughs> but Theoretically, the people who are working for the agency should have a vested interest in doing it. I don't think that there's any way that you can force people to read content that they're not interested in. You can work with the design to make it more appealing. So you accept that if they're not interested in it, then maybe they are going to skim the content. So break it up with white space, break it up with bullet points, break it up into multiple pages. If you want to see if they're reading it and you have the authority to say, hey, I know that you didn't click the link to see the next thing, well, you can certainly do that. Uh, I don't know if I would encourage it. I'd probably focus on the, the design uh, and making sure that the presentation of the content is going to make it as easy as possible to help people read stuff that they're not otherwise inclined to read. Uh, do I think images help break up the content? Yes, I would absolutely encourage you to use images. It's uh, 
it's like a page turn, it's a visual pause. So, you know, people are used to reading magazines and books, and that's why we have columns and magazines, because people only scan so many words across the page. Uh, you get a break, your brain gets a break when you turn a page in a book. And websites that are just presenting like 20 pages of text all in line without any break, it's going to be much, well, users are going to be much less willing to read all of that. And if you just put a nice image, maybe a caption to distract their attention for a moment, it gives their brain th that visual pause that they need to be able to continue going on to the rest of it. Yes. Yep. You have stakeholders who are wedded to content that maybe nobody else is at this point and probably lots of legacy content. Again, I go back to the data. Um, I've got a trick that I use where I recreate a site's current site map and I lay the analytics data over the top of it and it almost always shows that nobody is using the navigation structure as people thought that they were going to be doing. Uh, but it really comes down to setting the goals and understanding your audiences. If you are able to say not just, well, nobody's reading this content, but nobody's reading this content because it does not reflect back to what we're trying to achieve as an organization or what we're trying to achieve with this website, and it's not written for any of our identified audiences, then you can make a case that they either need to go back and update it to make it more useful or just cut it from the website. Uh, in the end, what usually happens is something like Amnesty International did and you throw some tags on it and you put it into a faceted research or research library or faceted search library so that the people who are interested in it, usually your own staff, can find it very quickly but it is pushed out of the way of everything else that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, that is useful for the folks who say, I just need a URL for this piece of content. They're not trying hard enough and you, you should encourage them to try harder. <laughs> Okay, I, please, if you are a developer of any sort, join for the sprints on Friday. They're going to be here at the convention center. They are a lot of fun. And also, please remember to review this session. This is a new talk for me, so if you have any feedback, good or bad, I would love to hear it. So all of the future people who may hear this are going to be better served than all of you were, sorry. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much.